praise God. Well, I know that some of you probably want to know a little bit more about my life story, but a few years ago when I was doing my undergrad at Michigan State University, they decided to do like a short documentary about my life, although I will talk, but that has like a very, like a short summary about my life story, and I'm, uh, you will have to spend a few minutes to watch it a little bit, and I will come back. My name is Carlo Dorve. I'm a trumpet performance student at Michigan State University. I grew up in Haiti, and I lost my arm when I was five years old, and I lost it due to an infection. I remember when I was uh, around, probably around seven, I used to see kids playing in the band in the street, and I, get, I start to be interested. By the time I was nine years old, I decided to ask the music instructors to let me play. And they said, no, you can't because you have one arm, you need two arms to play the trumpet. But I keep asking. I spent actually three years asking the same thing, even if they, they told me no, I could not. I always say, man, why did they say I could not? I know that I can use my pinky and my tongue to hold the trumpet. And I still have three more fingers. And because of my persistence, they decided to let me try. So from that time, I made a commitment to myself. I say, well, you know what? I should practice more than any other kids that I know in the school so that uh, my performance or my ability to play will be prove to them um, so that I can prove to them that I can. And that's like whenever I see the kids practice probably, at, for example, one hour, I try to practice too. There was a, an opportunity to come to the United States for a cultural exchange program. I came here in Michigan to Mott Community College, and then someone saw me play. And that person said, man, you are really talented. And then that person was an al alumni from MSU. And she said, man, why don't you go at an uh, audition at MSU? And I came and auditioned. When I heard that I will receive a scholarship at MSU, I, for me, that's one of the greatest news. As a poor kid, coming from Haiti to have this opportunity. I think it was like a dream. To those who offer support to MSU, the money is not in vain. And I think I'm one of the examples of this. When I play, often you will see my, my eyes close. I close my eyes and then try to play some, um, whatever I feel. And I put all my heart into it. You know, one thing I think that is very important in life, whenever you receive, you should find a way to give back. And one of my plans is to try to be like an example of motivation for many young people. I can really give them example, share what I've been through, how I, I overcome them, so that they can also um, do the same things. And one way, I think music, it's, uh, it's like a pencil. That I have, that I use as an artist to draw my future. Music will make a way for me. That's what I have. I have to use it. I, I don't plan to talk too much, but this, um, uh, just to let you know that I'm not at Michigan State right now, but I, I already graduated, uh, graduated there a few years ago, and now I'm currently at uh, University of Missouri. And I would like to introduce my friend who's playing with me today. And obviously I didn't know that she was going to be in town, but when, uh, that was last week, is that right? And she texted me, she asked me when I'm playing, and I said, oh, I'm gonna be here this weekend. And she, she said she's in town. I said, well, why don't we play something together? So we tried to put up, uh, put up something together. So we're gonna be playing a, a nice piece called Because He Leaves. It's a little bit of a challenge because we didn't really spend too much time practice. Um, we'll probably look at it once. Uh, and uh, it's have a lot of trumpet playing in it, so. Uh, we pray that God will be glorified as we're going to be playing this piece called He Leaves.
Well, let me share a little bit about my life story. Now, you see me play since Friday, and some of you may have some questions. In fact, I already have a lot of people ask me uh, about my life story, as if they already know that I have a life story. Um, I grew up in Haiti, and uh, you probably have seen me that I have a, one arm. You have different questions. So I lost my arm when I was four and a half years old. So how did that happen? Um, I have to say that my father was a baker, my mother was uh, basically uh, someone who sells in the street to take care of us because her and my father were not together because my mother realized that my father has a wife while they were together and my mother sneaked out of that relationship. Uh, unfortunately, um, around that time, I have to say that I've never seen my father and my mother in the same room my entire life. Like in, in a house, I never seen them together. So that leads to say that I don't really know my father, although I know my father existed at that time. Um, four and a half years old, I went to see my grandmother. And while I was in the countryside with my uh, father, my mother, my grandmother, I should say, and I fell on my arm and I broke my wrist from my right arm, and from that time, my grandmother thought if my mother knew what happened, my mother would be really stressed. After all, you have to remember, she was a single parent. And because of this, my grandmother decided to hide that situation from my mother. And after 14 days, well, while at time, she took me to a leaf doctor. A leaf doctor, it's, it's someone that use natural medicine, sometimes some of them to use what they call voodoo um, um, practices to heal people. And after 14 days, I mean, he ties some stuff on my arm. After 14 days, my arm became gangrene. And some of my uncles realized that. They said to my grandmother that we need to take him to the emergency. Now, it was not some, some place that is very close because where my grandmother lives was in the mountain. In the mountain, to be able to find public transportation, you have to walk at least five to six hours. So I remember that night, my uncle decided to carry me from around 1 a.m. in the morning, carry me so that they can get me there um, downtown where they can find transportation by six o'clock so that I can take me to the hospital. And they carried me during the night, and then uh, when they took me to the hospital, and the physician says, the doctor said, well, this is a very, uh, very bad case. We have to act fast. And they called my, my mother, and when my mother came, they said, well, this is, this is the situation. To save his life, we have to amputate the arm, otherwise he'll die. He'll, he'll go into, to die. And... Although that's for some of you may seem to be a very easy decision, but it was not. Now, two reasons why it was not as an easy decision is because that uh, someone with physical disability or any type of disability was not someone they look at. I mean, he was not, they were considered as someone who is a beggar, someone who is dependent, someone that will spend the rest of his life depend on someone, therefore, it is no good to invest in someone like this. So for the society, it was like a shame. In fact, immediately after my arm was amputated, when uh, my mother told my father what happened, my father told my mother that he did not have a child with one arm, therefore I am not his child, I am my mother's child. And Many other things happened around that time because my mother at that time was the mother and the father tried to take care of us, me and my older brother. It was not an easy situation. So she has to leave everything behind to take care of me and in many situations that she did not have money to t even take me to the hospital and has really bad uh, experience with drivers who even said, well, why don't you lay down in the street and get run over by cars so that you can end your misery with your 
handicapped child, all those kind of things was not a situation that will um, encourage a, a parents to really have a child with physical disability or any type of disability. But I'm grateful because God worked in my mother's heart and that this didn't um, lead my mother to did not disown me. I remember even growing up, I know a lot of kids with disability who, was dis who were disowned by their own parents. And so I was one of the luckiest one, I should say blessed one, because my mother think differently. And I guess if it was for my father, I would have been in the street. Probably who knows what would happen to me, what would have happened to me right now. So around that time, I remember my mother, since she knew that I have that physical disability, she treated me different, I mean, no different than my older brother. I remember uh, even I was younger, my mother never really tried to show me things. She expected me to figure it out. And I remember she would give chores in the house, and she will expect those chores to be done no matter what when she got back. And those type of mindset always helped me to believe that I could do, accomplish anything. And one more thing I, I believe that has helped me also when I was younger was that Although my mother was a single mother, but she will pray with me every morning, help me to memorize Bible verses. And that also helped me to understand that God can help me with anything. And when I pray, God always answers my prayers. So all those things help me to believe that whatever I want to do in life, I can do it. In fact, it's always um, fun for me when I see other kids do certain things. I feel like I need to challenge myself to do it as well. Now, how did music comes along? I tried to talk a little bit to give my lips a rest because I've been playing all day and it's make my lips a little bit tired. But since this is part of the, of the concert to share, I said, why not? Start right now. Um, so how did I start playing the trumpet? And from, the, from the short video that you saw a few minutes ago, um, I started playing the trumpet when I was about 13. Um, but... I remember when I started to be interested in the trumpet, they told me that I could not. And I had to ask for four years. Now, if I did not have a past where my mother always helped me to believe that I could accomplish things if I trust God and then do my best, I would have given up. Because who would persist for three years, almost four years, to ask one question. Can I play? Can I play? Can I play? No, you cannot because you have one arm. But yes, can I try? No, you cannot because you have one arm. Can I try? For four years, almost four years. And that was because I do believe that where there's a will, there's a way. I mean, for a lot of young people, sometimes they, it's hard for them to grasp that if they trust God, I mean, they feel that they have to do things on their own. Sometimes I learned this from Ellen White when she said, you know, uh, our extremity is God opportunity. So when you feel like you use all that you have, I guarantee you God will intervene. For me, it was very important to do my best. And for me, it was very important to never let go unless I feel I have no strength left to keep asking. Because I knew that I could. And... Each time they told me that I could not, and I have like basically an eye that tell me that, why? Because I know that I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, this way, this way, this way. And, but I did believe at that time that they will give me a chance. Because I also believe that when the blessing comes, I have to be ready to receive it. So it's basically anything in life. So sometimes we pray, well, but we're not, we're not ready to receive the blessing. Does that make sense? So I had to do my part which, to, to figure out how I'm going to prove them wrong. How, I mean, I watch other kids. I remember around that time I watch other kids. I say, oh, they hold it this way. And, oh, they buzz their lips. So I can do the same thing. So when they give me the trumpet, I was ready. And I take the trumpet and I blow. And I say, okay, we'll let you try. And from that time, I make a commitment to myself to practice more than the other kids because I know that it will require me more time to be at the level or even more time to get used to the trumpet. So I carefully watch how long the other kids practice. 
If they practice one hour, I try to practice two. If they practice two, I practice three. And in a very short time, I make more progress than all of them. And to the point they even asked me to be like a coach for my other classmates. Um, so all those things to say that nothing is impossible to God. Now, I have a lot of other things that I've been through, you know, a, when I was younger and I faced teased by other, I mean, bullied by other kids and family issues and in never being in a stable family. But one thing that always stay in my mind, I knew that God will take me out of those situations. And one of the things that has helped me too was school. And, and I said, well, if I have an education, I will be able to, to do whatever I want. And I will be able to leave behind that situation. And I remember um, it was very hard. One, I mean, when I, when I was done with my uh, elementary school, I was ready to go to high school. Of course, my parents could not really afford school for me um, because back home, you had to pay for school. And you, if you don't have money, you don't go to school. And the other way you can go to school is to be really, really smart and so that you can at least earn scholarship. Even if you earn scholarship, you still have to have something to pay. So for me, I, I remember I decided to pray, spend some time in prayer. I said, Lord, I know that at the end of this week, you will open some doors for me. I remember I, me and some friends, we decided to pray. We spent an, a week in prayer. And amazingly enough, God answered our prayer. Our uniform was provided and school was paid for. Everything was paid for out of the blue. And we went to one of the best schools in Haiti at that time. So I, all those experiences tells me that God, if you trust God, God can do all. And I'm going to stop to play a few more songs. Uh, one of the songs that I would like to play, it's a, it's a kind of challenging song, but I've been playing smooth songs since yesterday. Why not playing some, a little challenging one? And... This one, it's uh, one that I arranged for fun when I was a sophomore in college because I thought it was fun to just play with hymns and piano and try to arrange them, um, try to create some, some nice variations in, on the hymns. And this piece is called Clown Hymn with Many Clowns. So I'm going to be playing that with my uh, recording um, background music.
um, to play another song that uh, I forgot the name of it. What is the name? Hell, All the Power? I believe that's the name. Give me a second. The title is All Hell, the Power of Jesus' Name. some more talking um, now when did I get here in the US uh, obviously I'm not gonna be able to share the, my entire life story I'm gonna try to give as much as I can the good news is I think if you go to the ABC you find a book that have the, my entire life story and then also there's a CD if you want to have more music so that's a good thing um, I came I came here actually one week before the big earthquake that happened in Haiti and when I came here, I, as it was mentioned in that uh, short um, documentary, it was very difficult. You know, you ha came in, the, in, a, in a country where you have no family at all, and then the earthquake happened. It was very difficult. Um, but I always had that mindset that God will make a way, because even before I was in Haiti, God always make a way for me. In fact, I remember I have different issues. Sometimes I tried to come, uh, I was planning to come here in, in scholarship 
before, but it was very difficult and people tried to block the door. Sometimes when people uh, close a window, God opened a gate. And that's what happened for me in my life. So when I got here, it was very difficult, but I trusted God. And out of the blue, while I was playing in church, and someone asked me, said, man, said to me that you're very talented. You should audition at Michigan State University. And uh, I said, well, why not? So I decided to audition at Michigan State University. Believe it or not, I didn't try to audition for any other university because I believed that God w was going to open that door, and they asked me. So if we give you a full scholarship, will you stay at our school? And I said, well, I think that's why I came to audition for. I, I would probably stay. So then I, from that point, I knew that they were willing to give me a full scholarship. So they offered me a full scholarship at Michigan State University. But it was a little bit still challenging because when you go to school, you don't only need uh, uh, tuition paid for. You need uh, to live. You need, find, need a place to stay. You need food. All those kind of things. But at that time, I decided, I said, well, you know what? Let me do some concerts and maybe I can raise that money. And, but, you know, sometimes God delays certain certain um delay some result for you because he has a better plan and english was not my first language well still not my first language and it was a little bit of a challenge and for some reason i always do my best i have that pattern when i do my best god always do his and i did my best and i tried to work uh, to study for that test and for some reason i always get close never really pass the test and i said why and i said lord I, this is not the way we work. When I do my part, you do yours. And that bothers me for a while. I took it again. Same thing happened. And I took it again. Same thing happened. And after that, I back off. I said, Lord, there's something that I don't understand. Um, I know you love me more than I love myself. And I remember that bothers me so much. I said, well, I need to maybe to pray and then try to find out exactly why. And I back off and I say, Lord, I know that you love me more than I love myself. If it is your will, I will go to the school. If not, just cancel it, take it out of my way completely so I don't have to worry about it. And I was in peace. But immediately, actually, the week before, there was a few days before, uh, the director of the admission called me and said, Carlo, and we really would like you to come to the school. In fact, we offer you a full scholarship, but we cannot give you that scholarship unless you pass that test. And that's what makes it so hard for me to understand. But immediately after talking to God, I said, Lord, I know you love me more than I love myself. I'm not going to worry about this. If you don't want me to go, that's fine. That's mean you have a better plan for me. From that point, I, I was in peace. I remember the next day, I received a phone call from the, ad, from the same director of the admission who told me that there's no way, it's impossible for me. <laughs> Actually, I remember he repeat that word impossible he said it's impossible for the school to admit you unless you pass that test and he told me well be ready to start school in january i said what do you mean and he said yeah be ready to start school in january i said well did you tell me the, the other day that it is impossible for me to be admitted unless i pass that test he said yes i told you that but believe it or not the faculties of the university in the admission all agreed that you need to be at the school we're going to make sure that you come so you can start in January and we'll pay one semester of English, which have never happened in the entire history of the university. And, and I said, oh, perfect. That's mean God wants me to go there. But I said, well, maybe. And how about the money? Now, I, shot, I don't tell everything, but before that, I was in New York and I was taking lesson with one of Wynton Marsalis' best friends. And... He introduced me to Winston Marsalis, and I was also in the ITG International Trumpet Guild Conference, and I was playing there. I met one of the other, I was talking to one of the guys that I met before at Winton, Mar Winton Marsalis, Ben, and he gave me his number, he took my number, and he said, well, we're going to come to Michigan. And I said, okay. And he texted me, coincidentally, like, the next day or the same day that I received the phone call, he said, um, we are coming to Michigan and I have two tickets for you. Make sure you come back to see us. Come early. And I said, okay, I'm going to come. So when I get there, when Marsalis saw me, he said, well, I remember you. Make sure you play for me today. And I said, sure. So after the concert, he kept asking me to wait because, you know, after the concert, when Marsalis always uh, 
has a big crowd. He keep waved to me to wait. And after I play for him, he asked me a strict question. He said, what can I do to help you if I would like to help you? And honestly, I didn't know what to answer because I said, well, I don't know. Because I was say, taking a lesson with you. <clears throat> but the last time we talked, I remember we planned on that. That never worked. Honestly, I don't even know what to ask. And he said, is there anything else? And I think, I said, oh, maybe with my room and board. And he said, oh, how much is it? And I said, well, I'm not sure. Honestly, I'm supposed to start school in January. I'm not sure. I think it's maybe about ten to $13,000 a year. And he said, oh, give me your address. I'll send you the check. And that was part of it. And from that point, I said, oh, great. So I tried to write my address. And he was on a tour. He said, well, you know what? Take my cell phone. If you don't hear from me in three days, give me a call. Because I know that I'm going to be on a tour. I may not get everything done on time. But I've, I should definitely get it done by in three days. So in three days, when I called him, he said, well, don't worry about it. I already talked to my enterprises. They should take care of this. They called me immediately and take care of it. Every year when I was at Michigan State, they pay for my room and board. And sometimes they will ask me if, uh, if I want to come to council with where, if my, with Marcel is in, in the area where I am at, they will give me a ticket to come and see him and talk to him a little bit. And he always ask me to stay in touch and talk to um, let him know how everything is going. Now, what do I get from this story? I mean, sometimes it's good to, I mean, to something happen to you but not learn a lesson. And I learned that God timing is always the best timing. Because what if I was already in school struggling to pay for my woman board? I w that would not be an issue for me to ask him, right? And probably God knows this probably the, the best way. Because the first question he asked me, he said, are you in school? And I said, oh, no, I'm supposed to start in January. And then he take care of this from that point. I mean, we still in I mean, stay in touch. We still text once in, a, um, once in a while because I know he's busy. But God has opened that door for me. And I get my free tuition at Michigan State University. And also I have my uh, women board was paid for. Now, it's easy for us sometimes when God bless us to, I mean, I question why, actually, uh, straight. I remember the same first semester, I remember I was at Michigan State. Some students, I know, they were very talented in music. And one of them had to quit because he did not have money to pay for school. And that hit me. I said, well, why me? And I got everything covered. There must be a reason why I am here. And I start to ask why. And I said, Lord, maybe there's a reason why. And I remember one time I spent one night in prayer, well, a half night in prayer. And I said, Lord, I need to know why I am here. Why me? You give me a full scholarship and I don't have to pay anything. While in my eyes, I see a lot of other people quitting school because they don't have a way to pay for, for it. And I, and I remember that night, there's that thought that came to mind. Share your faith. Share your faith. Share your faith. And that hit me. I said, wow, I don't have to work. There are some students who work part-time. I'm going to consider this as my part-time job. And, and I told my church, I said, well, and I heard, well, actually out of the blue, I heard about Emmanuel Institute for Evangelism. And I said, well, maybe that might be something I should consider to go to, and then I can come back fired up. So they decided, when they heard that I was interested in that, they decided to sponsor me to go to Emmanuel. So when I came back, I will use all the opportunity that I have on campus to share my faith. One of them going to the cafeteria because I had unlimited meal plan and I can go to any cafeteria on campus. They have like almost every building you have a cafeteria at Michigan State because this is, I mean, they have over 50,000 students. So... I remember I will go to, to the cafeteria. I keep my eyes open, keep my ears, you know, open. And I, I keep, when I hear someone talk about God or even mention God or even mention something that relate to life, and I, I, I enter into conversation. And sometimes I will ask questions. I say, man, don't you think it is kind of interesting to ask yourself why the Bible, why people believe the Bible? Why not another book? And people say, yeah, that's a good question. And I say, well, you know what? Interestingly, interestingly enough, 
I have been discovering some stuff in the Bible that helped me to believe that the Bible is the only book that we can trust. And they became curious. Some of them, actually, a lot of them from that point became, started Bible study. And a lot of them are um, Adventists nowadays. Um, there are some questions I used to ask. I said, well, do, don't, don't you ever ask why bad things happen to good people? And that gave me an opportunity to talk about the great controversy. And I remember among them, I'm going to try to summarize, but among them, there were three that was very special to me, three people. One of them was a jazz musician. He, he came from Florida. His father is a Baptist pastor. And his grandfather was a Baptist pastor. His grand-grandfather was a Baptist pastor. And when we start talking, and I remember one time I asked him, what do you think if we start studying the Bible? And he said yes to me, but he quit. He always put me off. But the reason why he put me off later on I knew is because he always studied the Bible with people who doesn't even know the Bible. But he was a, I mean, his father was a pastor, so he's been in church all the time. So he knows the Bible. So he gave me a time. The last time he gave me a time was at 10 p.m. on Saturday. And I said, sure. I remember that night I was very tired, so I went to the Bible study on campus. And we studied about Daniel 2. And I call it, why do I trust the Bible? And I show, when we study how the Bible was consistent, um, and he said, man, I don't know. I've been, I've been in church all my life, but I never, I never studied that, that chapter. And that for him, he said, man, you're a Bible scholar. And I said, I say, I'm not. I'm just a simple member who just read my Bible. And the next time we schedule an appointment, to meet again and he was scheduled on me because he has a gig like a performance so he could not do the bible study and i remember i saw him at the lobby at the college of music and i say anthony what do you think about what by bad things happen to good people and he said well interesting question you know this is a hard question to to answer so i use the bible to answer some of this question and after that he said man you know sign me up for wednesday and then on a Wednesday, we start to study the Bible. I decided to take an assistant pastor with me because I started to have a lot of Bible studies, so I tried to pass them on. And I remember at that time, he was so curious. He said, well, you know, I've been looking for something like this. I need to know. And he said, well, I need to know because we studied the law, salvation. And after that, he said, I need to know who is that, the one that changed the law, who hoped to change the law. He insisted to the point that we had to study the the Sabbath. After he studied the Sabbath, I remember he went to the cafeteria. He said, man, all these years, my father's a pastor. I never know about the Sabbath. And I invited him to church. So he came to church. Three months later, he challenged his dad about the Sabbath. And he, said, he told his dad that he's going uh, to be Seventh-day Adventist. He got baptized. Now he's a pastor. He actually he quit the program at Michigan State. He went to Southern to study um, um, theology. Now he's a pastor in uh, Virginia. And I'm his pastor. Same time to that was the time that I was studying with uh, one of my friends who is now married to an Adventist pastor in Michigan. Yeah, she is, um, she did not grow up in a Christian home. But I remember when I started Bible study with her, she was very curious. And later on, on the same time, she got baptized. I'm going to make it short. With another Chinese friend that I met at a bus stop. I met her at the bus stop with a catechism. And I said, it seems that's very interesting. You love the Bible. And then she said, no, I don't. One of my friends tried to help me to become Catholic. And I, at that time, I was so serious about those Bible studies. I have a business card that said, free, uh, answer to the most difficult question, free Bible study, one-on-one, -on -one, through Skype, or by mail. And I gave her that card. I said, you know, I do believe that the Bible has a lot of interesting answers to most of the difficult questions. If you ever want to study the Bible, let me know. And she took the card. But at that time, you know in your heart that she may not call you. And I feel like, I said, I don't know. Maybe I need to get on her boss. But I said, no, this is not my part. I did my part already. God needs to do his. And I remember that night, I make that prayer. I said, Lord, if you really want this girl to know the truth, 
you have her email me or call me. The next day she emailed me. She said, it is pretty bold to say, answer to the most difficult question. And I said, well, that's even if he seems to be bold, but I do believe that the Bible has the answer. So we met and then have our first Bible study. She used to go to a Chinese Bible study. She quit that Bible study she, to come to my Bible study. And after seven months, she decided to get baptized. And now she's in China witnessing to other Chinese about God, about the Adventist message. So sometimes God put, bless you so that you can bless others. The God put, put you somewhere. You don't know why. Now, I try to quit music. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that. I try to quit because now you ask me why. I remember when I, after, uh, in my sophomore year, I um, auditioned, uh, do a blind audition, and I made it to the, to the orchestra. I mean, the, the orchestra, they only take four players in, uh, at Michigan State. I, when I was there, there were about four, no, there were eight doctoral students. I was a sophomore. So the chance for me to get to the orchestra was slim. But, you know, I make it to the orchestra. I was proud. I was very happy and feel like, oh, yeah, that's very good. Not until when I realized that, that three of the concerts of the orchestra is going to be on Saturday. And I said, well, what do you do? And I said, man, that's pretty hard. But I said, well, I cannot fake it because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And I said, and I told the conductor, can we talk? When we start talking, I said, I will not be able to make those three concerts because they're on Saturday. And she said, what do you mean? I said, no, I can't because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. She said, what does that supposed to mean? I said, that means I keep the Sabbath from Friday sunset to sun, uh, Saturday sunset. And he laughed. Um, two reasons. One of the reasons I think he laughed is because musician doesn't do that. In fact, I remember there were some other musician who, who were Adventists who doesn't really, I mean, who still come to rehearsal even on Saturday morning. Um, at 10 a.m. or uh, 10 a.m. usually. But for him, it was like a joke. And I said, no, I'm not coming. I'm not going to play those concerts. And that struck them so hard. They talked to all the faculty, start talking to each other about my situation. In fact, I remember one time while I was working, while the situation was fresh, and one professor come to me and said, hey, Carlo, I heard you have a new religion. And I said, oh. I don't have a new religion. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Have you ever heard of Seventh-day Adventists? He said, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, they keep the Sabbath. But, you know, I can challenge you that you don't have to keep the Sabbath. And I said, oh, Professor, that would be great. You know, I love the truth. Uh, if you can challenge me, that would be great. Why don't we meet and then talk about it? And he said, well, send me an email and then meet in my office. So I sent him an email and meet in his office. We start talking about the Sabbath. And after that, and I said, well, maybe you may have... You may need some, some other stuff to think about. Why don't you keep those pamphlets, talk about the Sabbath to see the origin of Sabbath and Sunday worship and all those kind of things, even the Sabbath and the entire Bible. Maybe after you read them, you can come back again. And he, he agreed, but he never come back. And that was one of them. My trumpet professor said, well, Carlo, this is so hard because I don't know any musician who, was, who have been successful who doesn't really play concert on Friday night or Saturday because it's just impossible. In fact, I checked my schedule or every musician that I talked to, they said, it's impossible for you to make it. Maybe we can ask permission for you. And I said, Professor, that doesn't work that way. And this is not my pastor's belief. This is my belief. And it's hard for me to just know that the Bible says something and then I'm going to ask someone if that person agreed. And so other faculty start talking to me. The director of the ensemble said, well, okay, Carlo, you cannot go. You cannot play for the orchestra. Why don't you play for the wind ensemble since we have a tour and we're going to be in Carnegie Hall and we will really love to have you because since you one of the top players and I could based on your audition. And I said, I, I'm assuming I can do the tour, but when is the performance? And he said, well, the performance is going to be after sunset, that's for sure. But we do have 30 minutes rehearsal in Carnegie Hall um, on Saturday, though. And I said, oh, Professor, I'm sorry, I can't do it. He was shocked. He said, Carlo, you probably don't understand. That's probably the only time you will ever play in Carnegie Hall. And 
30, and he said 30 minutes of your life will not destroy you. I mean, it's only 30 minutes of your life. And I think about it, I said, well, and I said, and then, you know, that thought came to mind. I said, I said, well, Professor, I, I understand what you said, but do you know how long he took Adam and Eve to sin to bring this world in this mess? And he laughed. And, and he didn't laugh, actually. He shake his head because for him that doesn't make sense. And this, what came out of his mouth, he said, Carlo, I'm really sorry for you. I said, Professor, honestly, don't be sorry for me because I know I'm doing the right thing. So God has, because of those reasons and many other reasons that I face at Michigan State because of my faith, and it was kind of hard. But because all those issues, all the other students start to witness at Michigan State, I remember, some professors, when they see me talking to other students, they feel like that I'm going to talk to them about the Bible. They keep pointing, talk, talking to each other. They say, he's trying to get another one. He's trying to get another one. Because three of my friends who were in the music program, no, two, already quit the music program because... They were jazz majors. I mean, a lot of those requirements, they have to be in clubs and play those kind of things. They decided not to do it. And plus they feel like, oh, I can't do that anymore. I have to back off. I have to, this is the Sabbath. I cannot really, I will have to not be in rehearsal on Saturday. I will have to, not to be on Saturday night or Friday night in, in, the, in the club and playing, all those kind of things. They decided to take this out. Um, I decided not to, uh, I said to quit after, after my undergrad, I said, I'm, I'm going to quit. And I said, and they offered me to stay at Michigan State. I said, no, I'm not staying. And March, they were still asking me. I said, no, I'm not staying. I said, well, take my name in the system if that, that's going to make it easier. Because I said, well, maybe now I can just go to theology and be done with, uh, with music. But, you know, I learned differently. God probably put me somewhere that People will know about, there are people that I meet that will know about the Sabbath, not, not a pastor would be able to meet. And I realized that later on. And I remember I applied in Jews. They were excited for me to come to Andrews. And, and I started to feel bad. I said, Lord, I don't know. I think if you want me to go there, you'll pay for my way there. I said, well, why don't we make that deal? If you want me to not go to Andrews, you open another door. And immediately, another door was open at Penn State. Now, I didn't want to go to Penn State. I have to admit, I didn't want to go. In fact, they asked me to audition, to send some audition. I said, I can't come. And I said, well, you know what? I, am in exam, um, I have exam week, so I'm not coming. And I said, well, why don't you send us a recording at least? And I said, well, uh, recording, I don't know if I have time. I give all the excuses that I could find. And, but at the same time, I was supposed to go to London for, to record a Paralympic commercial in London. And I said, well, I'm leaving. And before I left to London, they sent me a confirmation, like a, a letter said they, they give me a teaching assistant position at Penn State. And I said, wow, it seems like it's for real. God wants me to go there. So when I get back from London, I decided to go to visit Penn State. And I said, Lord, I, I don't know. I don't know if you really want me to go to those situations that I've been at Michigan State. And I said, well, let's make a deal. I'm going to go to the admission and tell them that I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and I will never, for anything in the world, do uh, rehearsal on Saturday or play on Saturday or Friday night. And if they say yes, that will be my sign that that means I can come. And I remember I went to the admission. I said, "By the way, I have a question. Do you do you do they have concerts on Saturday night, on Saturday, or on Friday evening?" They say, "Oh yeah, we have quite a few." And I said, oh, by the way, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I will not be able to do those things. Will that be fine? And the admission said, oh, don't worry about it. We'll work it out. And for me, that was not enough. I said, well, Lord, maybe, maybe they did not understand what that means, really. Because they are in the admission, they are not, not necessarily musicians. And I said, well, let me talk to the director of the ensembles. So I went to him. I said, oh, do you have concerts and rehearsals on Saturday sometimes? He said, yes. And I said, oh, I know that I have an offer of, to be a teaching assistant here, but I will not be able to do any concerts on Saturday or rehearsal on Saturday or Friday night. And he said, well, Carlo, that's very challenging, but we'll work it out. For me, that was almost done because since I did not want to go, I said, Lord, one, one more, one more. 
And I said, let me ask the trumpet professor, because he's the one who signed my assistantship anyway. And I said, uh, I said um, Dr. Langston, I, I, you know, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. He said, what is that? <laughs> and I said, Seventh-day Adventists are people who believe in the Bible, who trust the Bible and the Bible alone, and also believe in the Seventh-day Sabbath because it is biblical. He said, what is the Sabbath? And I explained what the Sabbath was. He said, Carlo, this is very difficult, but don't quit. I think they can work it out. And from that point, I knew that God wanted me at Penn State. When I, get, when I was at Penn State, it was very, still very difficult um, because the first week of school, and I saw the schedule, I saw some rehearsal. One of the dress rehearsal was on Saturday morning at 10, and I said, well, I can't do that. When I said I could not do that, that my professor forgot if I even said that even from the very beginning that I will never rehearse on Saturday. I will never do those kind of things. And he said, oh, Carlo, that's not, that's not acceptable. Why? Why you do those kind of things? You cannot be a teaching assistant and not be there as a principal in the orchestra, not being able to do this. And I said, Professor, I understand. And I said, well, you will have to contact the, all the faculty to let them know. And I said, that's perfect, because God gave me an opportunity to tweet. And I remember, even if he asked me to send a letter, so I went to them separately to find an excuse to tell them about the Sabbath. And after that, I sent them a letter explaining what the Sabbath is to them. And it was interesting because one, once, the fact that you stand up for God for once, he opened many doors for people to know about the Sabbath. A lot of the students realized that I, will not, I, I don't go to some dress rehearsal. For example, there is a mosaic concert every year. And the only person is, who is not there is me because they take the entire Saturday for that dress rehearsal. It's very challenging to perform in that concert without being there because we, we perform in the dark in different spot we have to move. But I was, not, I was the only one. Amazingly enough, when I come on Sunday, I always say, well, you know, I was not there yesterday. They say, oh, we know because we, we heard that you're a Seventh-day Adventist. You keep the Sabbath. That's one. Another one, there was a Jew student in a class that I was at. And he came to me one, he said, well, are you a Seventh-day Adventist? I said, why do you ask? He said, because I realized that you, you never in class close to sunset. You always left before sunset. And I said, yeah, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Could that be a Jew? He said, well, most likely I think Seventh-day Adventist will be the one who will keep the Sabbath that way. Actually, the conductor, he's a Jew. The first time we met, he said, he said, I know you cannot be there, so if I put the, the rehearsal after sunset, will you be able to play? And I said, absolutely. So we, we work things out this way. Even many other occasions, and I don't know if those are in the book, but I'm trying, I know I take a lot of time. I hope I didn't take too much. Um, so God opened doors for me, even at uh, University of Missouri. I'm going to try to, um, maybe if you want to know more about those Penn State stories, I can tell more. But let me share a little bit about... Uh, University of Missouri. Again, after many other trials at, at Penn State, I decided not staying in music. And I apply at Angels again. Actually, I was admitted uh, last year to do the MDiv at uh, uh, Angels University. But I was still bothered. I said, man, Lord, I'm, I don't want to choose myself where to go. I want you to choose for me where to go. And it was very interesting. Actually, there was even um, like a reformed church. The pastor that I met in a studio, and then he asked me to come to play for his church. I went and played for his church. And he asked me later on what my plan was. And I said, well, I want to study theology. I'm going to do a master in, in divinity. And he said, oh, I can help. And why don't, if I, I can maybe give you a full scholarship in our university. And I said, and then give you a house to live. And I said, oh, that sounds really interesting, except I don't want to do that. And he decided, to, he even willing to pay for me. But God opened another door for me to University of Missouri because that's what I asked God. If he wants me to go, give me a better deal somewhere else, and I'll go. And then University of Missouri came. Um, when I went to University of Missouri, and I was called to be a TA, teaching assistant with the matching band, matching Mizzou. And 
I never really think about anything about those things because I've never been in marching band at all. Um, although I know a lot about brass instruments. And uh, I remember one rehearsal, and the, the, the fr no, first meeting, they told me that I have to, um, to meet in an also there's a, on a meeting on Saturday. I said, oh, I can't do this because I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And the director called me immediately and said, well, Carlo, do you understand? Is that a one-time th one thing? I said, no, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I cannot be in anything on Saturday related to my work. It was very challenging. Now, I have to explain, a matching band, they have basically football game almost every Saturday. For me to be uh, an instructor and then not be there, it's very difficult. To be even assistant director of one of the ensemble, it's almost impossible, right? But I, I told him, well, I can't do it. But thankfully, you know, God opened that door. Because you stay faithful, God opened many doors for people to know about God. Some of the Christian who never knew that the Sabbath was on Saturday has some conversation with me. They realize that the Sabbath is on Saturday. Even students, students start to question me and then watch more stuff about the Sabbath online and know about the Sabbath too just because I stand up. And even the faculties, they even meet with me to explain to them what the Sabbath was so that they can help me to keep it. And going to Europe, they do the same thing. Even sometimes there's performance that I have to do. And then if it is on Friday night, they have someone else or the prof one, one the trumpet professor there to, to cover my spot. All to say that God sometimes can bless you to be a blessing and to be a witness. I'm going to play some few more songs. I know I'm taking a long time. I don't even know what time is it. But I'm going to try to do my best. Not, not, oh my goodness, 4.30. What if I play one more song or two? Is that okay? Four? <laughs> okay, praise God. Okay, I'm gonna. Is that two is fine or we need more? No? Two? Two is fine. Four? Oh. Two is fine. And uh, maybe I can play another time. What? Oh, see. What, what if I play two, maybe next, next year, if I come again, I can play more. Okay, the song that I'm going to be playing, it's, um, one, one of them is a medley. Tell So Sweet, My Jesus I Love Thee, I Surrender All, that's one song. And the last one going to be You Raise Me Up.
You know why they're clapping. One more? Uh, okay. Um, sure.
Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Some asked for two, some asked for four. We're going to stop at three. But you know how you can hear more. Tonight after sundown at the ABC. Yes? Yes. yes. <laughs> Tonight after sundown at the ABC, Carlo will be available to talk about and autograph his albums that you'll have available over there. And uh, so we'll see you over there tonight. I might take a nap so I can be over there with you there. Yeah, awesome. Well, as we conclude just this wonderful time, it is wonderful when you can see through the talents of someone that, that God has not only sustained, but just gifted someone. Have a voice into the lives of others to share the faith of Jesus and the wonderful message of the Sabbath in such a practical way. And I so appreciate hearing story after story of how you, you, seven, you mean you never heard about that? Come on, I'll tell you about it. You know, I love that. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and for your music. Thank you. Thank you. Let me pray with you and we'll dismiss. Lord in heaven, we all look forward to heaven when we can play like Carlo. <laughs> Thank you for gifting him so wonderfully. Thank you for sustaining him as a child, for shaping and molding his life to be a vessel of your grace and your love. And we all desire to be instruments in your hands through your grace and through your love. So thank you for all that you've done and will continue to do. Bless Carlo in his life and his ministry. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.